шапку сейчас принесу. И водичку дайте мне тоже. Бутылочку. Да. Доброе утро, уважаемые коллеги. Мы рады приветствовать вас на открытии уже третьего сеченного скобиомедицинского саммита. Меня зовут Бутнару Денис Викторович, я являюсь директором научно-технологического парка биомедицины, в, которых, в котором мы сейчас находимся. И два предыдущих саммита, которые прошли в 2017-2018 году, оказались достаточно успешными, привлекли большое количество внимания исследователей. И поэтому Сеченовский университет решил провести, проводить саммит, Сеченовский биомедицинский саммит на регулярной основе. Сеченовский биомедицинский саммит уникален тем, что притягивает себе внимание не только ученых из кросс-дисциплинарных областей, но также и фарминдустрию, научные фонды, а также представители государственной власти. И сейчас мне бы хотелось предоставить слово для приветствия первому проектору Сеченовского университета Андрею Алексеевичу Свистунову. Доброе утро, уважаемые друзья, уважаемые коллеги. Я рад приветствовать всех в Москве на открытии третьего международного Сеченовского биомедицинского саммита. Действительно, когда зарождалась идея проведения такого саммита в 2017 году, мы не знали, получится ли это так масштабно, так интересно и так, самое главное, продуктивно не только для нас, но и для всех участников биомедицинских исследований России. В 2016 году в нашем университете мы создали научно-технологический парк биомедицины, который стал по-настоящему исследовательским ядром Сеченовского университета и объединил не только междисциплинарные команды, но и создал по-настоящему эффективные интернациональные взаимоотношения, интернациональные коллаборации в исследованиях. За эти полтора года, как мы проводим саммит, и за, за те два с половиной года, как мы организовали научно-технологический парк биомедицины, у нас есть, мы считаем, большие успехи. Эти успехи связаны с выходом более 9 статей, сейчас 10 на рассмотрение в журнале Lancet, 3 статьи в Science, 2 статьи в Nature и одна статья в Nature принята уже в этом году. Это все результаты совместных интернациональных команд, которые работают с нашими исследователями, с нашими, которые возглавляют международные исследователи возглавляют лаборатории в нашем университете. И сама идея, что саммит станет площадкой именно прорывных идей, прорывных наработок России и мира, нас вдохновляет на новые успехи, на новые коллаборации и на новые достижения. Я думаю, что сегодняшний третий саммит пройдет также эффективно и плодотворно. Всем желаю интересной работы и новых идей, новых коллабораций. Спасибо. Большое спасибо, Андрей Алексеевич. И я хотел бы предоставить слово первому заместителю министра науки и образов... высшего образования Академии Куран Российской Федерации Трубникову Григорию Владимировичу. Уважаемые коллеги, уважаемые друзья, мне очень приятно быть сегодня в этом легендарном университете, в этом замечательном зале. От имени Министерства науки и высшего образования позвольте поприветствовать всех участников, 
международного биомедицинского саммита, который проводится в Сеченском университете, в третий раз уже проводится. Мы очень рады, что это действительно международное научное крупное мероприятие, где принимают участие не только ведущие российские исследователи в области биомедицины, персонализированной медицины, трансляционной, но и наши зарубежные коллеги, что говорит о том, что интерес к исследованиям, проводящимся и в России, и конкретно в Сеченском университете, он высокий, и ну, мы все прекрасно знаем, что наука не имеет границ, не имеет национальности, и замечательный пример такой вот международной открытой хорошей коллаборации по самым передовым, по самым прорывным направлениям биомедицинских наук проводится здесь, в Москве, сегодня в Сеченском университете. Очень правильно, что в рамках исследований в области трансляционной медицины, персонализированной медицины идет активное внедрение междисциплинарного подхода в рамках совершенно различных научных областей. Это, конечно, дает возможности для новых открытий, для ускорения внедрения новых технологий в практическую сферу. Для России, для Российской Федерации персонализированная медицина является одним из приоритетных областей исследований. И вы знаете, что в стратегии научно-технологического развития России, которая утверждена президентом в декабре 2016 года, стратегия эта утверждена до 2035 года, одним из семи приоритетных направлений исследований является как раз науки и области, связанные с персонализированной медициной. И в числе национальных целей, обозначенных нашим президентом в прошлом году, одной из самых главных является улучшение качества жизни, продление, продление жизни граждан Российской Федерации главный и важнейший приоритет для нашей страны. Конечно, находясь здесь, на площадке Сеченовского университета, нужно сказать, что у этого университета особая роль в Российской Федерации, кроме того, что традиционно университет является организатором подобных крупных международных, международных мероприятий. Для нашей страны это еще и один из флагманов в области персонализированной медицины, активно выходящей на международный уровень. Я хочу пожелать успехов участникам форума, хочу пожелать успехов отдельно молодым исследователям, студентам и аспирантам, для которых участие в мероприятиях подобного уровня, конечно, является не только возможностью познакомиться с ведущими мировыми учеными разработками, но и на практике применять свои исследовательские наклонности и таланты. Желаю организаторам, участникам и гостям третьего Сеченовского международного биомедицинского саммита плодотворной работы, ярких впечатлений и продуктивной полемики. Спасибо. Большое спасибо, Григорий Владимирович. Сейчас разрешите слово для приветствия предоставить председателю Совета Российского фонда фундаментальных исследований, Академику Российской Академии наук Панченко Владиславу Яковлевичу. Спасибо. Доброе утро, дорогие коллеги. Я, мне очень приятно, я очень рад приветствовать вот всех вас в этом зале на открытии вот такого третьего форума. Он уже, хотя и третий, но уже достаточно известный, стал на стране за рубежом, о чем говорит вот программа сегодняшнего форума. И э, я хотел бы передать приветствие вам, пожелания плодотворной, хорошей работы от Совета Российского фонда фундаментальных исследований. И сказать, что вообще мы всегда вас поддерживаем. Очень фонд, э, в фонде создан специальное направление по фундаментальной медицине. И многие, наверное, сидящиеся в зале являются грантодержателями нашего фонда, что мне очень приятно. Фонд в последнее время уделяет, ну, как в последнее время, последние годы, несколько лет, 5-7 лет, последние, уделяет большое внимание междисциплинарным исследованиям. Идея конвергенции. Мы стали почти 10 лет назад развивать концепцию конвергенции наук, дабы сейчас очевидно, что нет ни одной проблемы 
который можно э, такой моно, с, моно, с монодисциплинарным подходом решить. Это практически нонсенс сейчас уже. Но монодисциплинарность требует и э, специфики мышления исследователя, потому что он должен, с одной стороны, глубоко знать все отдельные разделы науки, в то же время иметь возможность интегрировать все эти знания в, в исследование конкретной междисциплинарной проблемы. И вот этому посвящено очень много наших проектов. В частности, вот совсем недавно мы запустили новый проект по углеводам головного мозга, где у нас работают и молекулярные биологи, и физики, математики, которые занимаются современными методами томографии, обработки данных. Потому что там тоже очень много так, неясных мест, и мы этому очень уделяем большое внимание. Появляются новые по подходы в томографическом, например, обследовании дыхательных путей, связанных с использованием высоковозбужденных состояний неких атом живущих. Это фантастика. Вот я нахожусь под большим впечатлением сейчас от этих работ. Хотя они давно известны, но сейчас они получили реальное воплощение. То есть на полутора Теслах получается разрешение, которое мы можем, но ну, оно в 4-5 раз превышает стандартное разрешение даже на более, так сказать, интенсивных томографах. Это большой прорыв намечается. Я не могу также не отметить очень важных, и вот здесь проявляется межспиональность подходов, такие проблемы, как это, наверное, основная часть проблем, это в принципе науки о головном мозге. Исследование Brain Science сейчас, несомненно, даже если посмотреть по объему финансирования, занимает одно из лидирующих положений в мире. И э, вот я вас приглашаю к, к сотрудничеству в этом направлении. Мы много поддерживаем э, таких работ, проектов. У нас сейчас готовится несколько их проектов. Это э, такая тема, тема века. И я думаю, что мы все вместе можем здесь получить очень интересный результат. К тому есть все, тому есть все предпосылки. Еще не могу не отметить тот бум, который в настоящее время вот мы наблюдаем в сфере так, в связи с появлением и развитием так называемых аддитивных технологий. Я должен сказать, что Россия, вообще-то говоря, здесь занимает лидирующее место именно в применении этих технологий в области биомедицины. Еще 20 лет назад в России были созданы 3D-стереолитографы, которые позволяли по томографическим данным пациента, которые можно передавать по сетям интернет, воссоздавать, делать биомодели или импланты, заниматься подготовкой сценария будущей операции, будущей хирургии. И сократить, это позволило сократить время самых сложных операций в 2-3 раза. Это был прорыв, который в России был достигнут еще 15 лет назад, даже почти 20. И э, сейчас вот, я просто знаю, что в вашем университете ведутся подобные работы на отечественном оборудовании. И э, мне кажется, надо развивать дальше э, вот это направление. Оно, несомненно, перспективно. Я поясню только, говоря о персонифицированной медицине, вот я это как физик по образованию, я как понимаю, вот мы до сих пор в медицине, скажем, в имплантологии, которую я так немножко более ближе знаю, может быть, мы работаем с, с типорядом, типоразмером имплантов. У нас есть там 10, 12, 15, также работает и физик, но с живым организмом так нельзя работать. Надо работать с персональным имплантом под конкретного пациента. Это можно сделать только при томографическом обследовании, который дает там... Ну, субмиллиметровые, по крайней мере, разрешения, сотни микрон разрешений, и приборы воссоздают этот персональный имплант, будь то клапан сердца, или эндопротез, или еще вот с такой же примерно точностью. Техника вся для этого существует, математика для этого существует. И вот именно это-то, если мы будем клапан там, или э, другой какой-то, э, так сказать, э, имплант, ну, другой э, части организма, который требует замены, таким образом воспроизводить, тогда это действительно вот будет в полном смысле слова персонифицированная медицина. Это же касается также и лекарственных средств, целевой доставки различных препаратов. Там тоже очень большая, там много проблем. И я здесь хотел бы отметить, что здесь нам очень сильно помогает и активно внедрять современные методы математического моделирования. Появление суперкомпьютеров, петафлопного, в ближайшее время уже экзофлопного класса, это 10-18, извиняюсь, 10-18 операции с плавающей запятой в единицу в секунду, 
позволяют моделировать очень сложные процессы, не только структуру, например, белка, что уже делать в настоящее время, но и кинетику взаимодействия тех или иных молекулярных структур, что очень сложно на самом деле, но это уже возможно в классе петофлопных, экзофлопных машин. Вот такие работы фонд тоже поддерживаются, они проводятся, и в них, несомненно, будущее. И возвращаясь к наукам о мозге в конце, я должен сказать, что, к сожалению, современные средства массовой информации, вообще наша жизнь высокодинамичная, это хорошо, с другой стороны, очень оказывает такое подавляющее часто влияние на сознание человека, в связи с этим увеличить число психических заболеваний, расстройств. Вот по статистике ВОЗа на сегодняшний день 10, ну 10-12 процентов населения земного шара психически нездорово. Это то, что обследовано. И вот уже три года фонд поддерживает такая очень большая программа у нас идет, которая называется «Психическое здоровье общества». И это тоже важное направление, где, наверное, всем нам нужно принимать часть. Там вот психиатры, пси... психологи, физики, которые занимаются исследованием различных полей излучений, которые исходят от человеческого организма. Ну и, соответственно, вместе с медиками мы обсуждаем, какие возможные средства помощи, создавать средства помощи людям, которые вот оказываются в такой ситуации, в несколько здоровой ситуации. Я желаю <coughs>, такой краткой приветствия, не подразумевает полный экскурс того, что мы делаем, и я постарался так вот вспомнить наиболее яркие, может, работы, которые вызвали огромное количество, вот, большой интерес, огромное количество заявок. Я вам сказать, что на медици... конкурсы по современной фундаментальной медицине мы получаем до... 10-12 заявок на одно потенциальное место, которое мы можем профинансировать. Это вообще, говоря, конечно, не очень нормально, но это говорит с точки зрения конкурсной деятельности, но это говорит о том, какой высокий научный потенциал мы имеем в нашей стране в области фундаментальной медицины, в области клинической медицины. И я вам желаю дальнейших успехов и успешного конгресса. Спасибо большое за внимание. Большое спасибо, Владислав Яковлевич. А сейчас разрешите слово для приветствия предоставить сопредседателю саммита, профессору Питтсбургского и Сеченовского университетов Валериану Ефимовичу Кагану. Разрешите мне начать по-русски. Я хочу приветствовать всех на этом замечательном форуме Микрофон, и напомнить вам, что Иван Петрович Павлов, великий отец, великий физиолог в этой стране, в России, он называл Сеченова отцом русской физиологии. Это большая честь для всех нас быть здесь. Но теперь, поскольку мы переходим на международную часть нашей программы, позвольте мне э, начать говорить по-английски. И э, I want to repeat that this is a remarkable honor for all of us to be here at this international Sechenov forum. The great Pavlov called Sechenov the father of Russian physiology. I think we have to all justify our presence, our frontier research, and I'm so happy uh, so that today, in addition to uh, these spectacular advancements that have been just mentioned, as the new developments so well advanced in uh, Russian Federation. So there are additional types of research that we will be listening and will be presented to us today. So this forum, the major topic is regenerative medicine. And there are new fields of regenerative medicine, such as uh, numerous omics. Among those are metabolomics and lipidomics. We'll listen to this at a special session. So there's also a session of new materials and nano tools for drug delivery. But let's go now today to the plenary uh, part of our presentations. And we have four spectacular speakers. And let me introduce the first speaker, uh, Bill uh, Wagner. He is a director of Institute for Regenerative Medicine at the University of Pittsburgh in Pennsylvania. And so he will share with uh, us his uh, ideas and concepts about the latest achievements and breakthroughs of the McGowan Institute for Regenerative uh, Medicine in Pittsburgh. Uh, большое спасибо, Валерий Анатимович. 
Но прежде чем выступит доктор Вагнер, я хотел бы слово для приветствия предоставить еще одному нашему гостю. Это, это директор международной научно-технологической компании МЕРК. И хотел бы слово для приветствия предоставить господину Юргену Кёнигу. Most probably you will ask what this German guy from a pharmaceutical company is doing on the stage. I need to correct you. Uh, our company is a science and technology company, first of all, and secondly, I'm not German and Brazilian. <laughs> Merck seeks to develop and support scientific and technological partnership in Russia. And we have shown it on several occasions, even recently on our event when we organized the Merck Science Dialogue. We are looking to implement educational programs with several partners, and not only on this institution, but from Moscow till Vladivostok. We also create and maintain local centers of competence. We are proud to start cooperation with one of the leading universities in Russia, this institution here, thanks to which our technologies will now be available to young scientists of this country, the next generation. This is our joint contribution to the future of Russian science, which will allow for Russia to be more competitive in the global pharmaceutical market. All the colleagues spoke a lot today about the personalized medicines. I believe it, I see there the future, and a lot needs to be done, and only with several global collaborations only with several global different ideas with the diversity we will be able to do it and I'm saying this we not only as we here in Russia or we in Brazil or we in Europe I'm seeing that we as human being we need the diversity of ideas we need the diversity of different kind of people to be able to really come forward on this extremely very important topic. I congratulate this institution to have this summit organized for the third time and I wish a lot of success in the forthcoming lectures, speeches and also discussions. I believe strongly on discussions, on change of ideas. I believe you all should use this opportunity because this will help us all as human beings. Thank you very much. Thank you very much, Mr. Koenig. В своем докладе Андрей Алексей, в своей приветственной речи Андрей Алексеевич несколько раз упомянул научно-технологический парк биомедицины. И я, как это директор этого парка, я бы хотел вам э, в короткой презентации показать возможности научно-технологического парка биомедицины, э, которая, эта презентация позволит более эффективно нам находить пути для коллабораций. Если можно, включите, пожалуйста, презентацию. Сеченовский университет сейчас фокусирует свою деятельность в трех основных областях. Это клинические исследования, это образовательный процесс и это фундаментальные исследования. На стыке этих трех областей, на их авангарде, мы и создали в 2016 году научно-технологический парк биомедицины. В настоящее время он представлен пятью институтами. Это институт молекулярной медицины, институт регенеративной медицины, институт персонализированной медицины, институт трансляционной медицины и биотехнологий. И в прошлом году мы создали пятый институт, который называется Институт биологических технологий и инжиниринга. Как вы видите, из этого перечня институтов наши исследовательские фокусы они являются междисциплинарными. Кроме того, мы стремимся в развитии университета в целом с 
к цели университета 3.0. То есть мы хотим не только проводить исследовательскую деятельность, мы хотим, чтобы результаты этих исследований становились достоянием общества, чтобы они входили в реальный сектор экономики и помогали людям. Поэтому одна часть нашего парка биомедицины – это отдел коммерциализации технологий, который очень тесно сотрудничает с институтами, и те наработки и разработки, которые близки и находятся близки к реальному сектору экономики, помогает их туда выводить. Исследовательская деятельность парка биомедицины. Я кратко расскажу о всех пяти институтах. Институт молекулярной медицины, он сфокусирован на открытии новых молекулярных маркеров и мишеней для лечения заболеваний человека. Институт регенеративной медицины. У нас есть все необходимое для того, чтобы создавать тканеинженерные конструкции, культивировать клетки, передовое оборудование и уже есть даже успешные примеры применения этих разработок тканеинженерных конструкций у пациентов. Институт в структуре парка биомедицины, в структуре Института регенеративной медицины также находится Биобанк Сеченовского университета, который является членом Международной ассоциации биобанков, принимает активное участие в нем, входит в структуру Биобанка в России, и в этом году мы уже запускаем образовательный проект по обучению биобанкирования в Российской Федерации. Все процедуры, все очень важно в биобанкировании, не просто иметь необходимое оборудование, которое у нас есть, но и соблюдать стандартные операционные процедуры, чтобы хранить данные надежно. Институт трансляционной медицины. Институт трансляционной медицины за ним фокусируется на разработке и тестировании новых лекарственных препаратов. Я хочу сказать, что в этом институте существует отдел Clinical Trial Facility, то есть это отдел по клиническим исследованиям, который очень интенсивно работает. Он, площадь его составляет 750 квадратных метров, и там расположено 39 коек. Кроме того, в этом году, буквально несколько месяцев назад, мы откры, открыли дополнительное подразделение Института трансляционной медицины. Это Центр трансляционной медицины. Его площадь составляет несколько 6500 квадратных метров. В нем находятся лаборатории для разработки лекарственных препаратов, для их тестирования. То есть это полный круг исследовательской деятельности. И также есть чистые помещения для доклинических исследований, то есть для исследований с животными. Институт персонализированной медицины фокусируется на телемедицинских разработках, на, разработках на клинической биоинформатике и математическом моделировании. В структуре Института персонализированной медицины есть... Мы создали клинику управления здоровьем, то есть это то подразделение, где исповедуется реально персонализированный подход к пациентам. То есть те разработки, которые формируются в институтах, о которых я сказал до этого, они находят реальное применение в клинике управления здоровьем, и к каждому пациенту есть индивидуальный персонализированный подход, включая геномику и прочие необходимые вещи. И Институт бионических технологий и инжиниринга, его принципом является транслировать механизмы живых систем за счет биоинженерных и инженерных технологий. И коротко в цифрах парк биомедицины, у нас сейчас на данный момент в парке биомедицины есть 11 лабораторий, 8 международных лабораторий, 7 исследовательских департаментов, 5 образовательных департаментов, как я сказал, клиника управления здоровья, биобанк, более 50 индустриальных партнеров и 250, более 250 сотрудников. Коротко о результатах исследовательской деятельности. В 2018 году в парке биомедицины было опубликовано 539 публикаций, из которых 50, практически 60% – это публикации первого и второго квартиля. В 2019 году, очень коротко, у нас уже вышла статья в Nature под руководством Андрея Чагина, это руководитель лаборатории регенерации скелетных тканей. Вышла статья в Nature под руководством профессора Валериана Кагана, который является у нас в университете руководителем лаборатории навигационный редокс липидомики. И вышла статья в Nature Genetics под руководством профессора Питера Леша, который руководит лабораторией психиатрической нейробиологии. Ну, я это представляю для того, чтобы мы понимали, что у нас не только слова, что мы действительно делаем науку, и у нас это хорошо получается на международном уровне. И пару слов о коммерциализации технологий. У нас совместно с 
Институтом фотонных технологий мы создали первый в России лазерный 3D-биопринтер. Совместно с Институтом МИЭД мы создали насос для поддержания кровообращения в сердце. Это кардиопамп или искусственное сердце. В Институте молекулярной медицины разработали лекарства для лечения неизлечимой болезни целиакии. В Институте трансляционной медицины мы сейчас создали две новые молекулы, которые являются новые в классе для лечения рака печени. И совместно с компанией Кардиокварк, Институтом персонализированной медицины, мы создали устройство, для, которое позволяет телефон превратить в тонометр и передавать данные об артериальном давлении на монитор врача. А совместно с IT-компанией Lions Digital мы создали универсальную биомедицинскую платформу для IT-решений в биомедицине. Для более подробной информации вы можете со всеми этими экспонатами ознакомиться на нашей выставке. Но о чем я говорю? Я говорю о том, что Сеченовский университет очень интенсивно развивается, и он интенсивно развивается в коллаборациях не только с учеными, но и с представителями крупного бизнеса, фармбизнеса и IT-технологий. Как можно выйти на общение с учеными парка биомедицины? Ну, Первое – это эта конференция, у нас площадка открыта для, для коллаборации, мы надеемся, что сегодня сформируются новые идеи, и которые начнут реализовываться на базе парка биомедицины Сеченовского университета. Но у нас есть сайт, сайт двуязычный, на русском и на английском языке, sciencesechenov.ru. В этом сайте есть разделы как для представителей фармбизнеса, индустрии, ученых со всего мира, также и для молодых ученых. Выйдя на этот сайт, вы можете связаться непосредственно со мной, с нашими подразделениями, с нашими институтами, и это будет отправной точкой для будущих коллабораций. Чтобы не занимать больше вашего времени, на этом у меня все. Для остального у нас есть время, два дня нашего саммита. Спасибо за внимание. Коллеги, я надеюсь, что эта презентация облегчит э, пути для совместного сотрудничества, но, э, как я сказал в, последнем, в последних слайдах, у нас э, университет выходит на новый виток сотрудничества с крупными компаниями. И сегодня у нас уникальная возможность, сегодня Сеченовский университет подписывает договор о сотрудничестве э, с ведущей международной научно-технологической компанией МЕР. Я бы хотел пригласить Андрея Алексеевича Свистунова и доктора Кёнинга к столу для того, чтобы подписать договор о сотрудничестве. Большое спасибо, коллеги, я поздравляю с подписанием, и, может быть, вы хотели бы сказать пару слов, или у нас уже все, все сказано. И я прошу представителей прессы проводить наших руководителей, наших подписантов к пресс-волу, и все вопросы, которые у вас есть, вы можете задать непосредственно там. Большое спасибо, Андрей Алексеевич, доктор Кёнинг, спасибо, поздравляю с подписанием договора. А сейчас, а сейчас я бы хотел э, передать слово, передать слово э, сопредседателю нашей, нашего саммита, э, профессору Валериану Ефимовичу Кагану. И как он уже озвучил, э, первый докладчик у нас, директор Института регенеративной медицины Питтсбургского университета. Вильям, пожалуйста, проходите. Валерий Ефимович, я передаю слово вам. Do you hear me now? So let me introduce our first speaker, Professor Bill Wagner. 
He is a director of the Institute for Regenerative Medicine in, at the University of Pittsburgh in Pennsylvania. And he will talk to us and present to us the latest achievements and breakthroughs of the McGowan Institute in the field of regenerative medicine. Bill? Thank you, Dr. Kagan. So uh, first of all, I'd like to uh, say thank you. Uh, one of the few Russian words that I know, spa, spa, spasibo. Uh, for the invitation and the hospitality, I've enjoyed uh, my first time in Moscow very much and seeing the beautiful sights and the perfect weather that I'm sure you have year-round just like we have in Pittsburgh. So I'm going to be talking about the uh, institute that I direct, the McGowan Institute. And um, to understand the institute, it is important to understand uh, some of the history of the University of Pittsburgh Medical Center. So this gentleman here is uh, Tom Starzl. He is considered by many to be uh, one of the fathers of organ transplantation and pioneered uh, immunosuppressive therapies that allowed uh, liver transplant, lung transplant, heart, etc., cetera, to, to really become commonplace. And what that did is it created a, a aggregation of expertise in Pittsburgh. Uh, organ failure expertise clinically, uh, immuno, uh, uh, immune therapies, um, immunology experts, and it drove patient volume. So we had patients from around the world coming to Pittsburgh in the 1980s and early 90s for organ transplant. This is before organ distribution rules were in place. Uh, that led to industrial interest. So if you were interested in an artificial heart or an artificial liver, Pittsburgh had more patients that would be part of a clinical trial than any other place because we had patients waiting for transplant and bridge to transplant, you know, keeping uh, patients alive with an artificial organ and teletransplant uh, was, was a common way to enter the, the um, clinical market. And then finally, uh, a clinical and preclinical testing, uh, again, these companies would come and want to do clinical trials or preclinical trials with their technology, and that led to more organ failure expertise. So the uh, McGowan Institute for Artificial Organs recognize that we could place uh, our engineers, basic scientists, students, uh, the, you know, this concept of convergence. Uh, you need diversity to have convergence. Uh, you need both of those. So bringing different skill sets together uh, to literally have a front row seat to see how these technologies fail. Failure is important. Understanding failure is how one advances. So by having artificial organ technology and seeing how it was not working, gave us ideas to make the next generation technology better. So in terms of the numbers of the institute, we're about 250 faculty members that are affiliated. Um, and they're a, a diverse group. We appoint for three years. So it's across health sciences, engineering, um, and a significant group at a nearby university, Carnegie Mellon University, which is very strong in robotics and uh, software development. So the departments with the most members, you can see surgery, pathology, bioengineering, plastic surgery, ophthalmology, cardiac surgery, orthopedic surgery, uh, chemical engineering. So really a, a diverse group. And there's many, many, many more departments. Uh, you, you see a similar theme here to, to um, the previous speaker uh, talking about innovation. If our philosophy is if it does not get to a patient, if we just publish papers, We've, we've not succeeded. Our, our mission is to improve the outcome for people with organ and tissue problems, dysfunction. And if our technology uh, ends up in a great publication that gets cited a lot, but it doesn't impa impact a patient, we've not been effective. So we keep track of and we celebrate patents, patent filings, spin out companies. We've spun out 32 companies. Uh, many of these have uh, products now that are uh, impacting the clinic. Uh, so this is, this is an important philosophical approach. And what it means is what we try to do with our researchers is at the very early stage of coming up with an idea, as all of you work in your, your fields and want to translate to the clinic, when you're coming up with an idea, the more you understand the pathway to the clinic, the better. So sometimes manufacturing, Sometimes regulatory pathway is too complicated. Sometimes you can't sterilize what you've made easily. And sometimes it's not good enough. 
So obviously we do statistics and we say 0.05, P less than 0.05, it's good, it's good. Um, but that may not be good enough for someone to invest money into your product because it may not be good enough to displace the current technology. It may not be good enough for the government or whoever is paying for health care to pay more for it. So we want to think about that as we're coming up with, with new ideas. We have a, a, a different approach than a lot of regenerative medicine centers and institutes in that we embrace organ and tissue failure technology. And the reason for this is our history is with, oops, our history is with um, medical devices. We started out as McGowan Institute for Artificial Organ Development, artificial hearts, lungs, liver. And then around 2000, we recognized stem cell technology and tissue engineering were different ways to attack the same problem. So we formed our Institute for Regenerative Medicine around this triad uh, that embraces all three of these technologies and compete. We have people doing cardiac uh, stem cell or stem cell for cardiac failure technology. We have people working on artificial hearts and we have people working on tissue engineered patches. So all of these compete, but they also synergize. They also complement one another uh, for new ideas. Uh, some of our, our successes, probably our biggest uh, impact uh, one could argue ECM-based materials or artificial heart. So the HeartMate 2 is a ventricular assist device that we developed in the, the late 90s with support from the uh, National Institutes of Health. And you can see the image here, um, a cartoon of the image, and some of our computational fluid dynamics in designing the, the, ter the, the blade attack angles uh, and the optimization that we did. This has been implanted now, and now it's over 25,000 patients worldwide it's most commonly implanted uh, ventricular assist device in the world today. Uh, we're, we've been working for the past number of years on a pediatric equivalent for this. Um, and this is an example, when you talk about pediatrics, it's an example where what I said about market falls apart. Because in so many cases with pediatric market, uh, not only are the patients small, the market is small. And there's usually not a big profit margin to incentivize companies to do this. So we're working with uh, the NIH and the FDA uh, to come up with technologies that would help to overcome that economic barrier. And you can see the problem right here with this uh, image of, of a young patient, a uh, neonatal patient, with the current technology. This technology is effectively 1970s technology. Um, it's, it's an old uh, pusher plate design. It has problems with thrombus. You see the clot there. That clot can break free. And in 2019, this is the best that we can do for, for young patients. Um, it's better than nothing, but it's not, it's not appropriate. So we're working on a, a rotary blood pump that's uh, magnetically levitated, so it doesn't have bearings. You can see it here with a, a battery. So very small, very efficient, uh, very biocompatible, and we're working to get this to clinical trials right now. We've done large animal testing, and we're now working with India uh, to develop this and get this into patients. Uh, another device that we're working on that's uh, moving towards clinical trial, we have a number of sheep uh, back in Pittsburgh implanted with this device right now. It's an ambulatory lung, so you can see the young patient here, and the idea is to be able to have something that's an alternative to what's called ECMO, extracorporeal membrane oxygenation, where patients are in an intensive care unit, on a bed, not moving, and being able to get them to a point where they can walk around. So it's a very efficient combination of a pump and a mini oxygenator to take over the pulmonary function. Um, keeping on the theory of, uh, or keeping in the topic of, of heart, um, this is a, a project that we've been working on for a number of years that addresses uh, cardiac failure by putting a, a temporary degradable elastic patch on top of an infarct. Uh, in the video you can see there, the, this is in a pig, uh, where the patch that you see on the right there has been uh, sutured onto the epicardium. And it, it's a girdle. It pro provides temporary elastic support and then it degrades away and has a beneficial uh, chronic stage functional benefit. Uh, just a, I have to put in at least one polymer chemistry slide. Um, so this is uh, some of the chemistry we use to make that degradable elastomer. So we're interested in elastic soft tissue-like materials. And this just shows that we can tune between a polycaprolactone ester and a polyhexamethylene carbonate thiol to get different degradation rates. So we can 
make the patch go away quickly or make it go away slowly. And we can tune the mechanical properties as well. Um, another thing that we've been doing is we've been interested in combining natural and synthetic materials. So um, there's pros, there's positives and negatives for natural materials, there's positives and negatives for synthetic materials. So by making composites, you try to optimize the best features of both. So the great thing about natural materials, extracellular matrix-based materials, is their inherent bioactivity. The bad thing about those materials is you have very little control on mechanics. Synthetic materials, just the opposite. You can control the mechanics well, you can tune them, but you can't necessarily impart the bioactivity uh, easily uh, or economically. So with uh, Steve Badalak in our institute, we take a cardiac tissue, decellularize it, make it into a gel, and then process it together with uh, uh, the polymer to get a composite material that you see in the lower right here that has the ECM combined with the elastomer. And then we use that as a cardiac patch and show improved results with that. Uh, another thing we do with the, the processing is we process with, for instance, adeno-associated viral vectors. So we can load the polymer fibers, the microfibers, with the um, AAV vector. And then we can use that to, transfect, oh, to infect the, the cells in the heart. So we can, for instance, put in VEGF and increase vascularization uh, underneath the patch, which is a, a project that we've recently completed. Uh, moving to valve, uh, we've done a fair amount of work in the valve area. This is some collaboration with uh, Harvard University where we did a single leaflet replacement. If you look carefully on the left image, you'll see that that leaflet looks a little different. That's three weeks after implanting a, a leaflet replacement uh, in an ovine model. And then you can see 16 weeks, it's very hard to tell which one is synthetic and which one is, is real. Um, so that gave us confidence that these materials function well chronically for uh, valve leaflet replacement. Uh, so then we've been developing now um, complete valves that are designed to, to mimic structurally and biomechanically. So the structure function relationship of the, the fibers and the, the native tissue. Uh, to get the, the four different valves. And these, uh, th this electrospinning process, you can develop different mandrels that match that particular patient. And you can see on the right is the, the created valve and on the left is a common uh, bioprosthetic valve that's used clinically. Uh, more recently, we've been interested in minimally invasive uh, transapical uh, or uh, vascular route delivery of valves, which is uh, made an increasingly large part of the, the market uh, in the U.S. Uh, for sure. And what we'd like to do is make these completely tissue engineered or completely degradable. Uh, so if you know those valves, they have a, a stent and they have the valve, and the stent is uh, uh, metallic and it's non-degradable. So we have a, a, a great uh, effort in collaboration with a number of universities on degradable magnesium. Uh, based materials, so we've been making magnesium stents that you see on the top part here, combining them with the elastomeric uh, valve materials, and we've only done this acutely so far in pigs, but you can see the, the, the functionality of that implant when it's placed in a pulmonary uh, artery position. Uh, another area that we've been interested in in cardiac failure is uh, instead of putting patches on, injecting into the wall. Uh, this can be with or without cells. This can be with or without your favorite uh, drug or growth factor. And this just shows uh, an injection in a pig model. Uh, you can see the white material is the, the hydrogel that's been injected. That goes into the, into the wall and, and thickens up the wall to mechanically protect that wall. And uh, again, the, I won't show you the polymer chemistry here, but the idea is to use uh, thermodynamics so that this polymer in the blue with the pink uh, attachments will collapse. It will thermodynamically, due to entropy, collapse into a, a stiff gel, which is what we want. We want a stiff material in the, the cardiac wall, relatively stiff gel. But then over time, those pink segments get hydrolyzed off. They have ester bonds. They get hydrolyzed off. That raises the lower critical solution temperature, and then it becomes soluble again. So this video, if you look at the tip of the needle, that's what it does in real time. So that's what you saw getting injected into the cardiac wall. So that will take up 
uh, resonance in the cardiac wall and add mass to it and change mechanical properties. So we've been working with uh, Carnegie Mellon Robotics Institute to make a number of uh, different variations of the robotic injection system. And you can see here on the lower left, it's like an inchworm robot. It has those suction cups that move along the heart. Uh, in the upper right, you actually see a beating pig heart with the robot attached to it and moving. If you look closely, you'll see it's inching along there. And then in the lower right, you see the robot on an uh, ex vivo uh, forcing heart, just showing how you can steer. The key part of this is, one, it's minimally invasive, sub-xiphoid approach, so you don't have to do open heart, open chest procedure. And two, you know exactly where you are because you have uh, fiducial markers on the inchworm. So you can inject your material exactly where you want to inject it mechanically. And you can optimize, personalize for that patient using MRI um, or other uh, echocardiographic methods where you put the gel for maximal benefit. Um, using that gel, you can do uh, other, other uh, types of tissue engineering. So one of the things we've been interested in is um, skeletal muscle as well as soft tissue, uh, adipose tissue. So again, we're collaborating with Steve Badalak, and at this time, we take that same uh, synthetic hydrogel, but now we combine it with urinary bladder matrix that's been digested into a gel. And then we combine that with mannitol particles. So the mannitol particles are, are used clinically right now already, mannitol is. But those particles create voids. So it's a porogen. So when we put in the mannitol particles and the UBM with the hydrogel, we end up with a porous, soft material that allows macrophages to migrate in and also has an effect on the macrophage phenotype, pushing them more towards an M2 phenotype. Uh, so you can see here the uh, effect on the left. It's polymer with no porogen, which doesn't really do anything except give you a uh, foreign body response around it. Uh, polymer with the porogen, you get migration in, but you get a thicker capsule. Uh, that's not three days, actually. That's, uh, I'm sorry, that's a typo. That's, this is eight weeks. So you get a foreign body capsule still. But when you have the porogen and the ECM, you get a, a very modest to no uh, foreign body capsule. And we've been using this in uh, adipose locations, showing that we can inject this and create volume and have very uh, normal looking adipocytes in that region. I'm going to switch now uh, to uh, liver uh, and other organs. So one of um, our uh, senior scientists is uh, Eric Lagasse, Dr. Lagasse. And uh, he made the recognition many years ago that, well, he didn't make the recognition, but he thought about the recognition that tumor cells like to metastasize to lymph nodes. Uh, every surgeon, every, many people know this, that the lymph is a very hospitable place for tumors to migrate and take up residence and form a new home there. So why not non-tumor tissue? What if you put hepatocytes in a lymph node? What if you put kidney cells or kidney cell precursors in a lymph node? What if you put thymus tissue in a lymph node? What if, what if you use the lymph node as a bioreactor? So he's done this with um, a number of different uh, tissues. The liver is the most uh, far along. And it avoids all these problems with doing this uh, with artificial scaffolding, bioreactors, poor survival, vascular occlusion if you use a vascular delivery route. And he gets very highly vascularized tissues. And you can see here his uh, ectopic liver in the lymph node here with a vascular structure very similar to the native liver. And then if you look at the, the various markers for uh, vasculature, um, you can see that indeed it takes up a very similar structure. And importantly, functionally, it can rescue uh, liver function. So he's formed a company, this is one of our spin-out companies, Ligenesis, and they're moving forward now uh, for, towards clinical trials with uh, uh, rescue liver function in the lymph node. Um, last topic I'll, I'll hit on here is uh, uh, one of the combinations that we've made. Uh, we, we, like to, we like to stimulate regenerative medicine in different fields. Ophthalmology is one. We have a, a regenerative ophthalmology center that I'm, I'm not going to talk about. Uh, we have a craniofacial regenerative center that 
I'm not going to talk about. A lot of things going on there. But one I will mention is with uh, rehabilitation science. And this makes perfect sense that anyone in rehabilitation science would know that if you do therapy, if you do surgery uh, to recover muscle function or something orthopedically, you need to think about rehabilitation. Uh, so early on in our work with um, uh, traumatic muscle injury, volumetric muscle loss, and using extracellular matrix to regenerate skeletal muscle, we combined with uh, Fabi Ambrosio, who's one of our leaders in rehabilitation science, and she worked to explore this effect of mechanical stimulus and training regimens on regenerative medicine therapies. And that ended up blossoming into an organization of a symposium on regenerative rehabilitation. Um, this has continued now every year since, uh, I think it started in about 2012. Uh, and it's continued, it's moved out of Pittsburgh now to other universities. And uh, uh, Dr. Ambrosio has combined with a number of uh, other U.S. universities, Stanford, Mayo Clinic, and University of Texas, among others, to form this Alliance for Regenerative Rehabilitation Research and Training. And it's a, it's a growing uh, effort. And actually, it's international with uh, Kyoto University also participating. So perhaps there might be some interest here in Russia in engaging with this group here. So with that, I will, uh, I will stop. I, I, I could go on and on and on. Um, I, won't, I won't do that out of respect for, for the program here. Um, but I would direct you to our website. It will give you a, a general sense of the different topic areas that we're, we're working in and uh, uh, the general philosophy of what it is we're trying to do, also the educational opportunities. So thank you for your attention. Uh, thank you, Bill, for this spectacular presentation. So this is a really a parade of uh, remarkably great new materials and devices at macroscopic level. So now we are moving to the next presentation where the major focus will, will be on uh, much smaller particles, nanoparticles, as they can be delivered to the brain and so as drug delivery tools. And this is Dr. Kreuter uh, from Goethe University in Frankfurt am Main. So please, Dr. Kreuter. Dobre uh, utra, ladies and gentlemen. I'm very happy that the organizers invited me not only to represent uh, the University of Frankfurt, Goethe University, but also the uh, Laboratory of Drug Delivery Systems of the Institute of Transnational Medicine and Biotechnology here at the Sessional University. Well, this will be the topic of my talk, track uh, transport across the blood-brain barrier with nanoparticles. I will start with the definition of nanoparticles as we see it, brain delivery with nanoparticles, chemotherapy, toxicology, mechanism, and also I will focus a little bit on attachment of targeting ligands. Well, our definition of nanoparticles, and this is a very old uh, definition already from the 70s at ETH Zurich, Swiss Institute of Technology, ETH Zurich, and we de defined at that time in the early 70s already, nanoparticles are solid polymeric particles of a size between 10 and 1,000 nanometers into which drugs or biologically active materials are incorporated, surface absorbed, or chemically bound. The size differs from the physical uh, definition because uh, quantum effects which are uh, taking place up to 100 nanometers are not uh, important in biological systems as far as we know. Well, the father of nanoparticles is Peter Speiser. He uh, was professor at the Swiss Institute of technology, ETH in Zurich, and he followed the idea of Paul Ehrlich of Magic Bullet and wanted to use nanoparticles as carriers for drugs. Well, my la latest focus has been uh, uh, dr drug delivery to the brain. And here you see a structure of, uh, st the structure of the blood-brain barrier. This is a cast of uh, 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 rat brain, 
where the uh, the uh, blood vessels, the capillaries, have been uh, fixed by injection of a raisin, by a po of a polymerizing uh, raisin, and the rest of the brain was digested away. And so you see here this structure of the blood-brain barrier. In the next slide, this is imp very important. This shows only a, a couple uh, of capillary uh, of cap capillaries, and uh, the important thing is uh, this bar. It is 50 micrometers, and it tells you that there is nothing more than 20 micrometers away in the brain from any capillary. There is no larger distance away from any, ca uh, from any capillary in the brain that is further than 20 micrometers. This is very important because if you think of implants, when you implant either a wafer or if you implant uh, particles into the brain, the maximal diffusional distance that you can reach is half a centimeter, five millimeters. And that's why very often wafers or implants or uh, even particulates in the brain fail in the treatment, for instance, of glioblastomas because the glioblastoma is still growing under the healthy part of the blood-brain barrier where it is not compromised and this is very often farther away than half a centimeter. And with nanoparticles, if you would be able to cross the blood-brain barrier here in the intact regions of the brain, then you could assess these growing uh, parts of the glioblastoma. Here is a, uh, a schematic drawing of the blood-brain barrier. The lumen in white surrounded by the endothelial cells and they are fixed together by the tight junctions. You see them here in this uh, slide. And these tight junctions are really very tight. They don't enable the, uh, the transport of anything, even not of water. And then the neurons, astrocytes, and parasites, you see this, uh, they are surrounding the endothelium. But the endothelium, and especially, as you see with this arrow, these ABC transporters, uh, they are responsible that drugs cannot, most drugs cannot uh, migrate, cannot diffuse through these endothelial cells into the brain. They are mainly located on the interior surface of the uh, endothelial cells, so where the arrow points to. Here's another cast, broad brain structure. Here you see again these cells, and you see here these tight junctions. No. Uh, you see an electron microscopic cast of the tight junctions on the right hand side. Uh, I don't know why it doesn't. It's too, too small simply. Okay. Well, I'm now coming to brain delivery with nanoparticles, and I'm showing the worldwide first experiment. Uh, where we could show, demonstrate, by the way, here at Sessiono, in a collaboration with us in Frankfurt, where we could demonstrate that nanoparticles are indeed uh, able to transport drugs across the intact blood-brain barrier. And the type of polymers suitable for brain delivery by nanoparticles are polyalkyl cyanoacrylates, polylactic acid, then the copolymer of the polylactic acid, serum albumin gelatin, and I put a question mark to chitosan. These are, for instance, polyalkyl cyanoacrylate nanoparticles. You see their structure here in this electron transmission, ele uh, not uh, scanning electron, micrograph, another example here, for instance, albumin nanoparticles. They all look alike, one would say, but, but uh, of course the materials are different. And uh, also the materials the polymers, of course, govern the drug that can be transported with them. Well, what we have, 
is a nanoparticle, for instance, polybutyl cyanoacrylate nanoparticles. We adsorb or incorporate the drugs into them, and then comes the very important thing, the engineering part. We coat them with polysorbate 80, or as we will see later with the polylactic acid, polysorbate 80 is not as efficient. There we call with pluronic F68. You see here these surfactants for overcoating that I mentioned, polysorbate 80, and then poloxamer 188, that's the scientific name for pluronic F68. And this was the first experiment, the World War I experiments, demonstrating that the nanoparticles could be used. And the animal experiment was carried out here in this building at, uh, no, not in this building, in another building, but at least at Sessiono University. And what we have here is the so-called tail flick test. And we have a, a mouse's tail and a hot light source a light source, and the mouse first let the light come to the tail, it warms a little bit, but after three seconds it gets to warm and the tail is pushed away. And if you have an, a, a, a injected an analgesic drug, like for instance morphine, it will stay there. It will not pull the tail away and it will stay there and after 10 seconds, the experiment is finished. It is truncated. And here you see our first results that we obtained here. You have a number of, uh, of solutions of dalagin. Dalagin is a hexapeptide that has analgesic properties, non-nociceptive analgesic properties, once injected into, the bra into a brain ventricle. But it cannot cross the blood-brain barrier. And that's what, why you see that all below 20 minutes you don't get an effect. However, and you can see that neither the dalagin solution nor empty nanoparticles nor a polysorbate solution nor uh, mixtures of that, only if you have the drug adsorbed to the nanoparticles and then overcoated with between 80s, you can get a dose-dependent effect that can be totally uh, prohibited by naloxone uh, pretreatment. Look at the dosages. In the other experiments, we use 10 milligrams per kilogram, and in the uh, experiment in the positive control, we use, not control, in the positive experiment, we used an increasing dose up to 7.5 mil milligrams per kilogram. This was carried out by uh, Reinhard Aljautin's group here at Sessional. Well, we also looked at other drugs and especially large peptides, again with uh, Reinhard Aljautin. We had uh, nerve growth factor and uh, uh, bra brain-derived neurotropic factor. And what we did a number of experiments, interest, uh, the most interesting one is this one, where you have the so-called latent period in the passive avoidance test. You train a mouse n not to go, uh, the slide, anyway. Uh, on the right side, you see a cage, two chamber cage with a dark side and a light side. And mice don't like the light side. They like to go into the dark side, but then they are trained for a week. They know that they can get an electric shock there. And so the latent period, you see it in group one, is about three minutes when they know that they can get a shock. When you then inject scopolamin, they forget. That's group two. And then we go uh, to group six because these other are just controls. And you can see that with uh, NGF bound to the nanoparticles to the, uh, and then overcoated with polysorbate 80, then they Re, uh, remind mind the old effect and you get a, a, a non-significant difference to, the, uh, to what they did before. Also, we looked at uh, Tremor score and we 
uh, for, against Parkinson, and Hemantan is, for instance, our control. You see the third in, uh, from the uh, top. That's Hemantan. And you can see this Hemantan, this sketched uh, column, has an effect against uh, induced tremor. But even better is there are a number of uh, controls. You know, sodium chloride only. Uh, not as a con untreated control, totally untreated, you see no effect. And you see that with the nanoparticles, with the NGF, and overcoated with between 80, that is the bar on the very right. You see that it is even better than hemantine. So we can see as a conclusion that this nerve growth factor bound to the nanoparticles can be transported into the brain and has a, a, a curing effect. Similar to that is BDNF, same experiments. Here is the before uh, treatment with scopolamine on the left side. And uh, here the, uh, the mice were more tolerant. But anyway, again, if you used uh, BDNF, bounded to the nanoparticles and overcoated. In this case, these were albumin, uh, not albumin, sorry, uh, PLGA, polylactic uh, co-glycolic acid nanoparticles. And what you can see is when you then overcoat these particles, only with after overcoating of the particles, you can reg again regain the uh, memory of the animals. Well, I'm now coming to the chemotherapy part. And uh, what we did is binding doxorubicin, that's one of the classic uh, drugs against uh, all sorts of cancers. And what we did together with Svetlana Gelperina, I don't know if she's in the audience. Well, anyway, she's working at the moment at Drugs Technology here in Moscow. And with her together, long time ago, we bound doxorubicin to nanoparticles and then overcoated the nanoparticles with polysorbate 80. And you can see that the controls, doxorubicin solution, doxorubicin plus polysorbate, or doxorubicin nanoparticles uncoated, they had no effect. That's on the bottom of the uh, slide. And we had a massive concentration in the brain when we measured the concentration in the brain when the particles were overcoated with polysorbate 80. Well, then we looked at a histological evaluation of the brain of rats with uh, uh, glioblastoma 101-8, with that we got by Dr. Kalansky here at the uh, National Academy of Science. And you can see untreated control a pattern very similar to human malignant gliomas with diffuse growth and significant amounts of necrosis. And according to the neuropathologist, this is the best model that mostly resembles histology and uh, morphologically human glioblastomas that they know. And here's our first experiment that we did with Svetlana Gelperina. And you can see on the left side, you can see the controls. The beauty of this uh, glioblastoma, it's a red glioblastoma. It is 100% transplantable, and the animals reproducibly die between day 12 and day 20. And that is the line, uh, the, the black-brown line and the right side. And then a number of controls we had here. And again, the uh, particles with uh, doxorubicin bound to the nanoparticles, overcoated with between 80. You see the red line. This experiment continued to 180 days. And no uh, animal died anymore. We repeated this experiment a couple of, a day, uh, of times. And what we found is that after 180 days, there was absence of tumor uh, 
in the, at the side of transplantation, one could see that there was something, in, had been something transplanted, I mean the tumor, but it was totally gone. So in principle, what we got after 180 days was a sign of cure of these animals. Well, one of the reasons is because the glioblastoma show a so-called EPR effect. The EPR effect enhanced permeability and uh, retention. In an in intact uh, capillary in the brain, particles cannot get without the treatment uh, with polysorbate 80, cannot extravasate. They keep, they stay in the, in the uh, lumen of the capillaries. However, when there is a tumor, then this uh, tumor, the, the, the capillaries get leaky and the, part, uh, the particles or macromolecules can easily extravasate and then we have no lymphatic drainage which we normally would have and by that they stay in the tumor. But the nanoparticles in our case when they are overcoated with polysorbate 80 in addition they can extravasate also in the parts where the capillaries are still intact. Well we have been then doing a number of experiments and we have uh, expanding our nanoparticle systems from the cyanoacrylates to polylactic glycolic acids and again we see the same thing uh, on the right side you see the untreated tumor growing you know all the animals die until day 20 and uh, the blue line, the upper blue line, is are uh, the nanoparticles from polylactic acid and uh, overcoat with F68. And this went, together with the company Drugs Technology here in, in Moscow, into a phase one clinical trial. And uh, this is the study design. We went up to group seven with 90 milligrams per square meter of doxorubicin and uh, you see here the parameters. Oops. And the outcome that the dose limiting toxicity and the medium toxic dose were not reached in all those groups. Cases of febrile neutropenia uh, also did not occur. The safety profile of this formulation corresponds to the safety profile of free doxorubicin. So there was no increase in toxicity. There was even a slight but not significant indication for a decrease of toxicity. Well, I'm coming now to the toxicity in animals. Of course, these, animals, uh, these experiments were performed before. And here you have the histological evaluation of a brain from rats with the glioblastoma. And long-time surviving animals, I'm talking about those that survived half a year, post-treatment with uh, doxorubicin nanoparticles plus polysorbate 80, there was no evidence of neural apoptosis. And the same was true with the animals getting the polylactic acid nanoparticles. You see, with doxorubicin, the main toxicity is heart toxicity, myocardial toxicity. And you can see here that uh, the control is a healthy uh, myocard. And then you see doxorubicin solution. After day 30, it has some severe uh, detrimental influence. And as you can see with doxorubicin uh, polybutyl cyanoacrylate nanoparticles, it's getting much better. Already Kuvra knew this. But when you overcoat them with twin 80s, it's getting even better. So the, the uh, damage done by the doxorubicin is decreased by the uh, treatment with the nanoparticles. Not by, yeah, by the nanoparticles. Another part of the body where you have uh, severe toxicity by doxorubicin is testes. Again, on the 
right side you see the control, and then you see in the upper slides that is doxorubicin by itself. You can see that it is even getting worse on day 30 compared to day 15, and the reverse is taking place when you have these uh, polysorbate-coated nanoparticles. The toxicity is going down uh, from day 15 to day 30, the influence of the toxicity, and already on day 30, 30% 30 of the tubules displayed normal spermatogenesis. Well, is what is the mechanism of nanoparticle transport across the blood-brain barrier with the nanoparticles? To make a long story short, it's endocytosis followed by transcytosis. We, together with Rainer Müller in Berlin, we realized at that time that when we used the nanoparticles in vitro and looked at the plasma protein adsorption pattern, we found that with between 80 and we also with between 20, but not as efficient, we were able to bind apolipoprotein E from the blood on the surface of the nanoparticles. Also, the ApoA1 uh, patch was increased. The amount of ApoA1 bound to the nanoparticles was significantly increased. Well, what is happening? Due to this coating, you saw this slide already before, of the polysorbate 80 overcoat, ApoE or also ApoA1 is adsorbed on the surface of the nanoparticles and then we are addressing, we, we have in, it identified the receptor in the case of ApoE, the LRP1 receptor. In the case of A1, it seems to be the scavenger receptor that we address and you can see already this effect of loperamide loaded albumin nanoparticles, loperamide, everybody knows it as imodium, and we know all imodium cannot cross the blood-brain barrier, it's used against diarrhea. And where you see, what you see here is uh, the upper line where we bound covalently the, na uh, the APOE to the nanoparticles, the others are the controls uh, uh, on the bottom, and it was even better uh, than the tween 80 overcoated nanoparticles. That's the second line from the top. So this was showing already that the APOE did some effect. And uh, yes. Well, then we were together with David Begley in uh, uh, King's College. At King's College, we were able to do uh, transmission electron microscopical pictures. Here we had to use albumin nanoparticles because the uh, cyanoacrylate nanoparticles and I think also the PLGA nanoparticles are not electron dense enough. This is a transmission electron microscope. It's, this picture is really textbook quality. You see two erythrocytes of these mice killed sacrificed after 30 minutes. And we see a similar picture in rats. You see th these two erythrocytes, and you see a nanoparticles after half an hour still in the lumen of the blood. But then, on the ba barrier up there, unfortunately this is not strong enough to show you, you see two nanoparticles. And when you magnify this picture, d uh, down in the bottom you can recognize a, a a tight junction and all that, and you see uh, parasites and, and, uh, and astrocytes. And when you magnify this picture in the next slide, you can see this one nanoparticle still in the lumen and two other nanoparticles in the endothelial cells. And what we also found with lant lanthanum nitrate that the tight junctions remain close. So the nanoparticles assess the brain by transcytosis. And after about 15 minutes, you can detect nanoparticles all over the brain. Here we see, two, for instance, two nanoparticles in a, a neuron. And David Begley, in the meantime already, he has detected that 
the transport of nanoparticles that can cross the blood-brain barrier. It's not between cells, even in the brain. It is, uh, the nanoparticles are delivered from cell to cell. He did not find any nanoparticles in the lumen between cells, in the extracellular spaces. Okay, so he uh, postulated uh, this brain superhighway where the nanoparticles are delivered from cell to cell. He did that already before he carried out these experiments, proving that this really was the, the case. So it was his hypothesis, and he had published it in a Science Translation of Medicine some years ago, 2012. Okay, my last part of my talk will be attachment of targeting ligands. We have already seen that when you attach uh, covalently attach apolipoprotein E, you can transport drugs across the, the blood-brain barrier. We mostly in our experiments use loperamide because these experiments are quick and uh, in contrast to the experiment with the tumor which take quite some time. And what you see here is the an analgesic effect of loperamide A1 nanoparticles and also ApoB has some effect. You see those dependent uh, effects and effects by different, no, here you see effects by the, the different uh, apolipoproteins. In the bottom, the bottom line is always the control, loperamide solution. Then you see if you bind covalently anti transferrin antibodies, the top two lines are different antibodies. One is the OX26 and the other is the R127 to, uh, to 17, both of them are able to transport nanoparticles with, uh, loaded with, doc with uh, loperamide and uh, covalently attached antitranspirant antibodies. As a control, we used normal IgG, and uh, the, the same is with covalently bound transferrin, so you don't even need antibodies bound. Anti but covalently, to, uh, uh, and uh, yeah, I think I have to come to the conclusions. Polysorbate coated or polyoxamer 188 coated nanoparticles represent a very promising preparation for the delivery of drugs across the blood brain barrier. A high incidence of tumor cure was observed with extremely aggressive glioblastoma 101 dash with polysorbate 80 coated nanoparticles. There was histologically no indication of neurotoxicity and uh, the doxorubicin loaded poloxamer 188 coated PLGA nanoparticles successfully passed clinical phase one and to my knowledge are now in clinical phase two. This is a paper from me where we, I uh, reviewed uh, all these advances uh, in the, for the drug delivery with nanoparticles to the central nervous system. It is, I think, now three years old. And, oops, and here are the acknowledgments of the people. First, uh, three people from my lab, then Svetlana Gelperina, Olga Filon, and Olga Maximenko at Drugs Technology, Kalansky at the Institute of Human Morphology uh, at the uh, National Academy of Sciences, Renat Al Yautin, I mentioned David Begley, Rainer Müller, and Eleonora Perezeva at the Gauss Institute. They all contributed significantly to our experiment. And I would wish, uh, I want to ask you for, for uh, I want to thank you very much for your attention. So thank you, Professor Perter. Now we, it was magnificent to hear how uh, nanoparticles with the protein coronas so make uh, miracles and deliver these drugs. So now we go, this is an international meeting, and we go again to the United States. And our presenter is Dr. Professor Yang Yang Zhang from Wake Forest University. And he will talk to us about optimized stem cell-based uh, therapies. Good morning. Um, thank you, Dr. Kogan. Um, thank you, com the conference committee, gave me this opportunity. Uh, it is my great honor 
and pressure to be here to present the, the, the stem cell therapy. Can I have slides? The, today, uh, we would like to talk about the strategy to the improve, uh, optimize the stem cell therapy. Can I have the first slides? This is the last step, this conclusion. Go, go, go further. You're in therapy. Maybe I can talk to her earlier. <laughs> so, save the. Great. Yeah, thank you. Yeah, this is a, a topic that I would like to uh, talk today. Second slice. Okay, I, yeah, I come from North Carolina, that's the uh, East Coast. Uh, we would like to talk about the potential impact of the stem cells on the, the patient care. We know um, globally, every one minute, uh, 10,000 people die. 10% of them can kill by the uh, regeneration medicine technology. Regeneration medicine includes three parts. One is biomaterial. The bill uh, talk about the uh, first today. Uh, scalpel and uh, hydrogel. The second is we are talk about the cell therapy. The cell-based therapy, that's included that uh, cell-seeded tissue engineering. Second is stem cell therapy. The last one is uh, the cell-free treatment that included that use the cell conditioner medium uh, or the, the secretome or the, the uh, PRP that's come from patient's blood. Then we talk about the, the current stages. So that was three stages. We said successful, uh, partially successful, and less successful. The successful we know is uh, the blood transfusion, the bone marrow stem cell transfusion for the Radio, uh, the injury, and the, the skin tissue generation. We talk about tissue skin generation for burn. That's, that's also partially, but better than the regular stem cell therapy because uh, the full skin generation still has a long way to go. The hair, the nerve, the, and the, the pigment cells still need uh, to, to, to investigate, to improve, and also CAR T cell therapy. That's a full treatment now in the clinical trial. It's pretty successful. And less successful is the stem cell therapy. Most of stem cell therapy so far is improvement, not reach the, the 90% uh, uh, success rate yet. So certain cases, it's all about the 30%. Some cases, 70%. Why do you have this uh, difference? So this we are talking about. Can we optimize? Can we improve? Can we increase the effect, uh, efficacy? And next successful. This talk about the, uh, the bill talk about the, the tissue engineering is very good on uh, this material. However, if we build a regenerate uh, the larger size of the part of the organ, that's faced the challenge. What's the challenge we face? For tissue engineering, cells viability due to the uh, revascularization. The second one is the graft shrinking with time uh, because uh, so far there's still a lot of the, the perfect biomaterial, well-matched material. And the third one, third one is uh, innovation, particularly for internal organ, that all the internal organ have a, the, the nerve control that. So innovation still is a uh, challenge. That's for the tissue engineering parts. We will talk about the cell therapy. Cell therapy still is uh, cell survival, longevity, and the, the differentiation trophy factor, cell fusion for the muscle and the nerve for cell fusion. That's we will, uh, how should we improve. Also, it's a big uh, the challenges for us. So the uh, standardize, standardize the protocol. Before we talk about cell therapy, looking for the, uh, the organ transplant, 
And the build today talk about the, the level transplant. This is excellent, uh, successful done in the Pittsburgh. This slide shows that 10 years ago, the result uh, kidney transplant successful, one year successful rate in different uh, uh, institute. Back to these uh, 30, 20 years ago, this result is worse. Look at this, uh, some uh, the institution pretty good, 90, 95% for the living donor or the cadaver donor or deceased donor. However, some institutions low. Back to the 30 years ago, 20 years ago, so 50, 60. Now, this 10 years ago is getting better. Now, so most of the institutions reach to 90 or 90, uh, over 90 successful rate. Why? Because they have standardized the protocol. Uh, before, so each institution have their own their, their protocol. Like Pittsburgh have Pittsburgh protocol. The Chicago have a Chicago protocol. And Shanghai have their own Chicago and the different country. So now today, the, the stem cell therapy faced this problem as well. How should we standardize? How should we optimize the therapy? At least the eight islands here, maybe we can think about how should we do that. But I would like to introduce some of the data, uh, what do we have. First the islands, cell types, cell source. What cell source we should use? We have different cell source. We have cells from fetal, from the uh, prenatal uh, source, from the adult stem cells. What type of source we should? What is the factor? This question we should answer. Should we use the patient's own cells or from the uh, alginate uh, uh, cell source? Third one, timing. What's the best time to give cell therapy, particularly uh, before the acute injury. Sometimes for the chronic injury, what's the best time? Uh, third question is uh, the cell dose, cell density, or the, the cell passage. Uh, so the, the more cells, the better, or the, the optimal passage time, what passage we should use? The fourth time is, uh, what I showed, how should we inject the cells? So that there's a four, four way, through the intraprenatal or through the intravenous or through the, the intra-artery or the local injection. So those things we need to uh, think well or test well, uh, test uh, and then uh, get the best result. Now for fifth, what the, the, should we combine the growth factor? Should we uh, the increase the cell variability, cell differentiation, or trophy factor? Uh, sixth one, can we use the cell, cell free products like we said, exome or conditional media or extracellular vesicles? And, and seventh, single injection versus multi injection. What's the benefit for single injection or multi injection? The last one, should we pre-treat cells before implant the, uh, in the uh, patient? Those studies, we need uh, to optimize in the, the animal, large animal, uh, before go to clinical. So I would like to introduce what we have, uh, we done this. Uh, and we, uh, this is cell source. So we know the adult stem cells from that source, uh, the four cells from bone marrow, edibles, skin muscle, uh, urine dressing cells, and uh, also prenatal, uh, prenatal cells, uh, so every cord, placenta cells, fetal cells, and maybe fruit stem cells. Each type of the category cells, uh, the mechanism is slightly different. For the adult stem cells, we know the trophic factor and the cell fusion. The, the, for the uh, prenatal cells, uh, include the transdifferentiation. The last of all, for the ear cells or IPA cells, that's for mainly for transdifferentiation. So recently we done the, the compare study. We try to answer 
we use the, the different type of cells, can we, uh, what's the benefit for, for, for the, the, each type of cell, stem cells? Is these stem cells achieve the same outcome or differently? So we use the model, uh, use the erectile dysfunction model, because uh, the, uh, in the urology clinical, the prostatectomy, after prostatectomy, the erect dysfunction ratio is very high. They can hide on, uh, up to the 90%. So, so far, uh, stem cell therapy is a pretty good the, the outcome, a pretty good the approach to prove the outcome. So what do we do? We, we uh, in, use the four type of the stem cells, sorry, four type of stem cells. Uh, number four is edible stem cells, that's for adult, adult stem cells. So the fourth one is umbilical cord stem cells, that's a prenatal stem cell. Fifth is the placenta stem cells, also is perinatal. The last one is the amino food stem cells, that's the fetal stem cells. Each type of cells uh, stand differently. So we inject the cells, uh, use the same dose for 10 weeks, uh, 12 weeks, about three months, that equal 10 years uh, for the human, but not exactly, just the uh, uh, stem for. So we follow the apple and see, uh, see What's result is this each cell uh, is uh, different or same? Same. So we quickly look uh, for the intra uh, commoner pressure. Result uh, show here. So AMC is age match control, it's normal. This 100% uh, we said, even we said it's 100%. Uh, then NC, NS is normal senin, it's a model injected uh, normal senin. The rest of the stem cells, this that uh, four of them is pretty similar. The animal stem cells, uh, immune food stem cells are uh, slightly better. So this uh, function study show no matter cells where it comes from, they, they improve, they can significantly improve their, their electrical function. But the, for, um, from fetal cells, uh, the result the function is slightly better, but also uh, definitely have significant difference. This is uh, a histor historical uh, outcome. We're looking for smooth mouth cells, never endothelium cells, and the, the uh, inos. Inos, that's a nerve function. So we can see only the nerve, the, 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 the NS, uh, normal cell injections, less. The rest of the, rest of the stem cell therapy is pretty similar to the control as in the significantly improve histology Histor function is pretty similar they recover the, the, after 10 weeks ten, uh, 12 weeks after injury that's long-term follow-up study so this is too slight uh, too, too small to show this slides show that each of uh, the percentage of recovery is pretty similar then we talk about uh, what stem cells we should use, right? We talk about different type of cells. Uh, it's possible we can find stem cells the easy way, no, in a way, no uh, invasive uh, approach. So as we know, they have a cell, uh, urine cell therapy, right? Urine therapy, urine therapy. Before, back to the 100 years ago, uh, the people used the, uh, the urine for the skin, for the, the uh, different treatment. Is there any variable chemical or some serious stuff okay, we can use? So uh, 10 years ago, uh, we found, uh, we first uh, demonstrated how stem cells in the urine. So I just summarized, due to tiny bit of, I summarized what we found. Yes, we found some very small amount of stem cells in the urine. However, this cell's generation capacity is huge. If we get one single cell colony, the cells can generate the, the 60, uh, 64 million cells for the four weeks, one single colonies. So how many colonies we get? We can get 150 uh, if we collect 24 hours. That's enough for we build any kind of the organ. Also, these cells have the uh, expressed uh, mesenchymal stem cells marker. Why mesenchymal stem cells marker? 
because uh, these cells we finally found, found from kidney. The kidney actually uh, from the embryonic uh, the stages count as a mesodermal kidney whole, uh, from the embryonic development uh, point of view. That's from the mesodermal. So this marker expressed the mesenchymostem cells marker. Also, the cells have renewal. The cells have expressed the telomerase activity. The cells uh, no telomerase term formation. That's good part. Also, the cells uh, the easy, easy to induce the iPS cells. Why? Because the cells, uh, see, they have the, uh, the telomerase activity uh, positive. Also, the express the SOX2, SOX2 OX4, CBC, this is for the gene in the cells, low level, low level, but it's much better than others. And they also the cells can differentiate different cell, uh, the, the cell lineage. All cells can uh, secretly trophic factor and cells have a immune monitor. Each uh, the items have paper, uh, one paper support. So I just uh, um, kind of in short. One most important slides I want to show, the slides that show the, uh, the stem cells uh, express the telomerase activity. As we know, telomerase activity is important uh, to show the, the normal stem cells and the cancer cells. We can see uh, at a different cell age, 20 years old, 50 years old, 40 years old, and, 20, and 50 years old, the percentage of the stem cells in the youth or middle age is around the 75%. Uh, the this means the 75% of the cell colony have expressed telomerous activity. However, uh, soon, uh, the age reached to the 50, the positive cells uh, decrease, uh, decrease. Uh, why we should use the urine derived stem cells? So, so far, I have so many stem cells. The reason, uh, the advantage of use the urine derived stem cells is the cells uh, can harvest through easy way, can completely repeatable. So even the cells, very small amount, but the, the generation capacity is so great. Now also, the cells, uh, when we harvest the no, no, no enzyme required, uh, maybe a lot of the, the students here, uh, we know if you get the tissue uh, from the uh, stem cell, uh, cells from the tissue, we need to digest the enzyme. Enzyme sometimes will, um, will injure the, the cells' viability. Our cells know enzyme. Also, nicely, these cells come from one single cell at, at the beginning. So it's easy to follow up, it's easy to expand the cells. Also, the cells, uh, like we said, 75 cells express telomerase. The, 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 the capacity is pretty good. We have enough cells can generate uh, for generation uh, properties. So the cells, we can use the cells, we can use the uh, vesicle, we can use the ECM. Uh, we use the ECM to uh, stimulate the uh, cartilage tissue generation. Uh, still, uh, because of the, the, the uh, counter side cells is very hard uh, to, to differentiate and uh, uh, expand, right, proliferate. So we uh, use the urine development cells as matrices, uh, stimulated cells. So now we ask uh, the question is, should we use patient cells or uh, allergenic cells? So we can see if we use the patient cells, the patients have chronic disease, then this generation capacity is decrease. The, the cell proliferation, trophy factor, differential capacity, immune uh, monitoring, uh, and so on. And the, the other size, we can use the young patients, uh, young uh, healthy donor cells. This is much better. So we have started to, to recently study to show, we collect the cells from the patient with the diabetes nephropathy compared to the healthy cells. We can see this is slice too busy. And I just want to show you the patient cells, the patient cells and the generation functions decrease. However, the pathology factor is increase. 
Now the older cells, the patient cells are bad. Now about 70, 75% cells are not good. The injury impaired. However, they still have 10 to 30% of cells, just like normal. Because patients, uh, this is what we will uh, first discuss. Maybe the, if patients still have the urine, they still can uh, pee. That means they have, still have some stem cells, uh, healthy cells available. Uh, that's what we thought, but we need more study. So we can use this impaired cells as a biomarker and use the healthy cells as cell therapy. The cells actually in the patients, they shift more, four times more cells than the normal. So then we can isolate enough cell source uh, for the cell therapy. So I'm not going through this detail. I want to save the time for, uh, for, for us to have questions. So we just talk about the, the, the patient cells, the generation capacity decrease and the, the pathology factors increase. Uh, second question is, what's the timing for cell injection? What's the optimal timing? So looking for the literature, if we use an uh, uh, example from the myocardial ischemia, the best time is, is not that patient get injury inject the cells. What's the best time? Let us uh, re, uh, the recorder, the tissue healing process of the injury. There have three phases. Phase one is the breathing and the, uh, the inf cells infiltration. Second is the tissue generation. Third is modeling. Now timing, this timing is very important. First of the time is hours. But usually it's one, two, three, three days after injury. That's the time. Second phase is the generation time. It's the three to seven days after injury. And then seven days after, that's the remoting time. Best of the timing is the second time. Why? First of the timing, the cells are dead, cells necrosis. The, the, the environment is toxicity because the acid uh, astrosis there. So if you inject the cells that time, most of the cells are dead. Then the last time is not good either. Why? Because that time is a fibrosis replaced the, the, the injury, injury uh, sites. That's fibrosis, uh, not much of the blood supply. The second time, the blood, uh, uh, the, the capillary start the recapitalization also have the stem cells, local stem cells that get stimulated, start the generation. That time, if you inject stem cells, the cells will seed in, will, will expand it, will grow. That's best time. This is for the uh, actual injury. How about the colic injury? Colic injury, recently we did a study. Like the, the generally speaking, the earlier, the better for the chronic injury. Uh, for example, you use the kidney example, uh, chronic failure. So we, we create this model, this, <laughs> no point. So we create the model, we wait for the, uh, this model is a do injury model, uh, kidney ischemia and the genomycin injury, uh, nephrotoxicity in the do injury. So this, uh, Kidney failure is uh, not reversible. So we use stem cell therapy, then the function that recover half of it. So what's the point for that? We found that cells are still in the kidney. They can last for like, 12 weeks after injury. Also, the fibrosis and collagen deposits decrease. The chronic uh, information is decrease. Oxidative stress fibers decrease. Uh, oxidative stress proteins decrease. The number of the glomerular and the, 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 uh, the tubular preserved. So this for this uh, therapy, the outcome. What we want to say is uh, if it is a chronic disease, uh, we have to use the earlier. For the acute injury, we have to find uh, the timing. 
So we have the rest of the, 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 the islands. I'm not going through that because I have time limited, but I want to quickly to summarize what we, what do we, do, what we have result. If we have time, we can discuss more with, my, uh, with our data. Cell, cell dose and the pass, uh, cell passage, it's not the more cells, the better. The importance, is we will we'll see how large of the, uh, the injury. If this large size need more cells, definitely. But if we inject the cells in the, through the artery, we need, we need to think about, uh, well, uh, if injected too much, the cells will block the artery, like the, the renal artery. Inject the cells more, uh, throw them some buses. So we need to think about that. Then rest of them, then uh, what the way we should do? Uh, so the best way is to inject the cells nearby the injury sites, and also uh, uh, in the artery if the whole uh, organ is ischemia. So if we combine good factor, we're much better. So the cells uh, free therapy this will help, but this is only for one kind of injection. If the cells can stay longer, then stem cell therapy will be better. Um, and Single cell therapy uses for the acute injury. The multiple injury, multiple injections for the chronic injury, and also for the severe injury. The last one, yes, if we can uh, pre-treat the cells with hypoxia, it so will be much better. So the stem cell therapy now can use for any kind of organ and tissue is already the report. And urine development cells only, also is injected each organ. So no organ or tissue left behind. So I would like to uh, thank you, our uh, postdoc and the fellows work with us and our collaborator. Um, this is Wake Forest the University and uh, Regenerative Medicine, this uh, mission, vision, order. The mission is improve patients' life through the tissue generation. The, the vision is leading global trans transforming from the uh, treatment to cure. And our core value is the innovation, teamwork, and uh, integrity. This is uh, W. France, uh, faculty, and uh, the staff. I uh, have four, 450 people here. Um, I want to uh, end of my speak. Thank you for your attention. So th thank you so much, Dr. Zheng. And uh, of course, uh, more older generations of people present here, they can regret that uh, our stem cells have not been preserved at younger age with lower telomerase activity, longer telomeres. So, but the younger people probably will take benefits of this. And now we have to move to the last uh, presentation at this plenary session and we'll again return to the issues of uh, functional pharma pharmacology and human drug targets, and the presenter is Professor Schloth from Uppsala University in Sweden. So, I will, let's see. How, uh, you hear me? Um, my name is Helge Schutt, and I come from uh, Uppsala University, and um, I have uh, recently taken on the role to be uh, Vice Director for Institute here at Sechenov, and uh, I'm very happy to help on several of the drug discovery projects, and therefore I'm going to focus on, on drug targets. And uh, I'm also working on uh, improving the publications and uh, publication rates. And I'm very happy to help anybody who wants to, me to give a lecture on, for example, uh, how to write scientific papers. Maybe you have papers that have been redacted many times and we want help and, and uh, somebody to look and uh, improve them. So I'm, I'm very happy to help in many different ways. So, um, and this uh, picture there is uh, from, uh, from uh, uh, Iceland, where I'm born, and uh, what will I talk about? Because I'm uh, recent here, uh, many people want to know a little bit more about what we are doing in Uppsala, so we'll start on that, and then I will go into the drug targets on a, a general basis, 
and then I will talk about GPCRs, and we'll see if I have time in, in the end to uh, give something about the evolution origin of the different families and, and, uh, and uh, uh, something more. So, uh, first about our group in Uppsala, I have about 30, 40 people. We publish about 30, 40, uh, about 20, 30 papers per year. We can divide it into a molecular biology pharmacology lab. We have also a Drosophila uh, genetic lab. And we have human neurobiology biology lab, metabolic lab. We have working with eye trackers, metabolic units. And we have quite strong uh, biostatistics groups of doing genetics, epigenetics, cohort st studies, which I call the dry lab. We have funding from many different uh, agencies, so we, we are quite and unusually broad. And to uh, illustrate just an uh, example of a one project that we do just recently submitted, which is unpublished data, uh, that actually integrates all these four components in our lab. I'm going to talk about uh, the statins uh, target, HMGCR. Uh, statins are one of the most uh, prescribed uh, drugs in the world and um, uh, to, to lower lipids. And what was uh, curious it was that that the HMGCR came also up in the genome-wide studies uh, linked to BMI. So, um, uh, but nobody really understood why this uh, connection is there. Another thing that people did not know was that what is the role of HMGCR in the brain? There's a large expression there. And um, what we use uh, as a primary screening model is that we have taken uh, many hits uh, that have been identified through genome-wide association studies and we knock them out in Drosophila one by one. And as a matter of fact, this is an approach that can be used for many different disciplines uh, because you have, uh, uh, you have many genes that have been associated to different diseases or different phenotypes, but we don't really know how they work. So, we, so one of the hits, and we published several of the hits uh, already, uh, uh, and, uh, but one of the hits that we are working on now is the HMDCR, and we, we screened to that, and we gave a very strong phenotype. So we specifically inhibited the gene in the uh, insulin-producing cells in the brain, which correspond to the hypothalamus, and found uh, uh, effects reducing insulin signaling and uh, decreased body size, hyperglycemia, we have hyperphagia, and increased uh, 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 lipid storage. And um, so we took this into the rats and mice mouse model, and found that also that acute inhibition of the HMGCR stimulates hyperphagia in rats. And so this demonstrated that it also uh, that this works in the, in the rodent model. We also made uh, studies in human. We have access to many large cohorts and where we show evidence that uh, statin treatment actually uh, inhibits glucose homeostasis. And uh, this uh, provided the first evidence uh, of, of this. And just about the experimental data behind this, we see there, this is from the Drosophila. On the top there, we have the expression of HMGCR in fat flies, and the bottom panel shows the starved, where the expression is much lower. This is verified on the bottom panel with uh, qPCR. And we also looked at the signaling pathway, and we have the adipokin peptide, uh, the, the hormone, and we, we done Western and show that this is also reduced. Uh, and this state is also dependent on whether they are, um, and what kind of a, a diet they are. Are they on high sugar diet or in low sugar diet? So this potentially has an implication for all statin users that uh, if they want to stay down in weight, which is extremely important, obviously, is that not to, uh, is not to have a, use a high sugar diet where you get a, a bigger effect. And this uh, illustrates also that, that you have, when you have a high sugar and a low sugar, you have a major difference in, in these phenotypes. And uh, we are working on this further and knocking it out into, in, in, in rodent models. Uh, this is uh, in, the, in the rat model where you show the expression is differentiated uh, between uh, the different, uh, uh, different foods. And we have also measured the brain activity using CFOS, which uh, uh, lightens uh, up the activity of which regions. And they show that actually it's the feeding regions in the brain that are uh, affected by the statins. 
Uh, just to link to our fly behavior lab, uh, uh, then I, I want to mention that we have a number of equipment to automatically measure and do a large-scale screens in the flies, uh, both for drugs, for toxicology, and also for individual genes, but you could basically buy any uh, gene and, uh, and our prior strain had already been knocked out and, and characterized in them. And uh, this is a relation to, to Russia, uh, because it was Pavel Ichkov who developed one of these equipment. We bought that and set it up and collaborating with him. He published it in Nature Communications, uh, where he actually detailed the eating behavior in the fly. It was very, very useful. And now we are developing several different other equipments. So now we'll uh, go on to the main topic here, which are the drug targets. One of the dilemmas that we had uh, in uh, regarding what is the identity of the drug targets in the human genome is that many of the databases are full with uh, redundancy. For example, then in beta adrenergic receptors in the, in the drug bank have uh, found the nine different variants. Uh, we have the, the what are the different uh, drugs interacting with? Yes, there's a lot of redundancy, there's a lot of holes in the databases. And people are always taking this uh, data and doing comparison between uh, different databases. And if you haven't curated and you know what is actually in your database, then it's like what we say in bioinformatics, shit in, shit out. You will not get the conclusions and see the trends of what is going on if you don't have a very curated and good data set. So what we, just another example of that, uh, one of the uh, most common target in the human data, uh, uh, human genome from, uh, or derived from the human genome in a drug bank is albumin. I mean, I, okay, albumin interacts with a lot of drugs, but that's not the therapeutic effect. So we went out to sort this out, and um, so in the top here uh, on this slide, we sorted out uh, things that do, do not have an identified uh, uh, function, or that can be amino acids and so on. We talk about those are the drugs that are acting on virus and bacteria, and identify the uh, number and also the therapeutic, media, the, the, the target in the human genome that mediates the therapeutic effect. And uh, then this has been updated in, 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 in several times. And um, we have, this is over 500 uh, drug targets that are identified. We can then sort them into different classes. And we see that the G protein coupled receptors and other receptors are on the top. Enzymes, we have transporters and several other molecules. And there is a clear differentiation how these are used for different, uh, um, uh, different, um, uh, uh, for different indications. One of the questions that has been raised in the, in, the, in the pharmaceutical literature is about the lack of innovation. People say that you spend a lot, a lot of money on drug development, but you don't have an innovation. And innovation has been going down. There are several reviews that actually suggested that. So we could, after doing this uh, curation, we could um, uh, actually analyze that. And the conclusion is, and we can like, like a di define the amount of uh, of innovation by doing this. And so we have about 90 new chemical identities in the human, derived from the human genome that is approved by FDA every year, in average. But only four of them are directed to a previously unexploited molecular uh, target. So, so obviously most of the development is done, I mean, on targets that are already of new drugs on it, and there are only four, about four. But what we have analyzed it, we see that it is actually quite stable over a 20-year period. So the innovation is definitely not going down. It is more, more stable. So, but to look more into the future, we would like to see what is, what is in the clinical tri trials. How does that compare to what is approved by the FDA? And this is a very, very difficult task because well, you can go into the uh, clinicaltrial.gov uh, database where all the clinical trials are listed, but you find there about, yeah, at least 150,000 now uh, different uh, trials. And the description is not systemized uh, at all. It's very chaotic uh, kind of information, obviously uh, not standardized. 
So to parse that and go through that is absolutely or almost impossible. Nobody has done that in a sensible way. So what we did was we actually got access to a center watch, a, a private database that have been like uh, updating the new things for several times, and that was uh, more hand, uh, could be handled. So we tried to curate, so identify, first of all, the, what are the drugs, I mean, what are the alternative names, I mean, what are the tra targets, what is the therapeutic, uh, what is mediating the therapeutic effect. So we, 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 we've done this, uh, which was obviously took a considerable amount of time. And so just to give some of the conclusions from this is that uh, when we look at established drug targets versus targets in clinical trials, so what we see here in blue is the established targets and red is the uh, target used in the clinical trials, I mean beyond what has already been uh, used. And then we actually see that innovation gray, uh, is, is very, very high. We, it was, for many people, was surprisingly high because, I mean, to, to enter a clinical trial, I mean, you have to have a reason, you have to have funding, there has to be a good logic. Obviously, the, the experimental uh, group of drugs is obviously much, much bigger. But we see that this is also highly differentiated what type of a drug you, we are talking about. So we, for example, see the rhodopsin family at GPCRs, there's a considerable amount of innovation there. I mean, this is a leading uh, uh, drug for uh, group uh, or target group for, for, the, for the approved drugs. But we see, for example, for the channels, I mean, both the ligand gated channels, other channels, the innovation there is much, much smaller. And nuclear receptors, yeah, there were hardly anything that we could, could find. However, on the other hand, that you say more that the red high bars, we, for, say, for example, see that um, ligands are very, very interesting and growing uh, uh, targets. And what we see also that several uh, kinases, I mean, serine threonine kinases are, are very, very popular. So, and uh, this figure here adds another element to it. So how many genes in the genome are left in the different groups that are not targeted? So that is a strange color that is a little bit, of, uh, uh, little bit purple is, uh, shows that. So, so that is then normalized against that. And, and, and this, many people say, okay, this should, uh, is the druggable uh, uh, set of targets which, which we, we don't have any clinical trial. And this is just to go, in, I mean, it's difficult to see here in, in this, but, uh, but we have mapped this for, for many, many different families. So, if we go from the targets and focus more on the drugs themselves, so to how do they look like? So, we see here on the A, on the left side, that is the FDA approved drugs. And we see the blue one, that is the small molecules. So that's the small molecules, a dominating uh, factor of the FDA approved. So, but if you look at B, we see that that is what is going on in the clinical trials. And then we see there's a major, major change there. And where well, the, the small molecules shrink as a percentage, and we have a number of uh, groups that are expanding, and, uh, and several that yeah, cannot maybe actually be classified yet because there are, they are, they are, they are so few in each, each group. So, uh, what we see that uh, the biotechnological breakthroughs ha have given us ligands, and we are focusing now, actually, we are communicating with Nature Reviews Drug Discovery of another paper that focuses on the ligands as drug targets. I mean, they are very tough in, uh, in nature, I mean, uh, drug, uh, reviews drug discovery. They, they got an impact now for 50, so uh, there's a reason for that. But they're very, very professional. And um, we previously had papers focusing on the kinases, and uh, so, so there's, there's a lot of stuff there to, uh, to analyze further. So, uh, one of the things or the analysis that we did was the uh, look at the orphan drugs and their impact on pharmaceutical development. Um, in 83, there was the um, Orphan Drug Act, which provided financial incentives and also like a shortcut to registrated drugs. 
And uh, we wanted to see, okay, what is the consequence of this? And the orphan drugs that are like defined, that they are intended to treat uh, rare diseases, uh, conditions affecting one in 200,000. So we, we, we looked at our data set and updated in this and, and published this in trends. And uh, what, what, what clearly shows that uh, this act has a major impact. And uh, so if you look at the molecular, new molecular identi uh, entities, we, we see that they, um, on the orange there, as a portion of the, uh, of the whole thing, is a, like a growing proportion, and that is shown also in the B and the D. Um, so that we, we see that this is having a growing effect on, on drug development. Um, so, um, if you look at the different classes, you can uh, then uh, look at the same thing, what is in FDA approved and what is, has been, uh, 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 what is going on in the clinical trials. And we can kind of look at both the biotechnological products and you can uh, divide the data set in and call it as like a modern biologicals, I mean, depending on the degree where where the classical antibodies, which are a uh, uh, dominating factor, are the, are the classical biologicals. And you see that in all these groups, and also here below, where we look at the uh, small molecular ligands, the orphan act has a major impact. And looking at uh, cancer drugs, you can see that uh, <laughs> the, the, this is actually a leading uh, phenomena within that using this uh, um, um, orphan drug act. So you have a, a cancer that has uh, affecting few people and then obviously when you got it accepted you are going to go for the blockbuster. So people obviously notice that this maybe wasn't the intention of the act but anyway. So what we see that orphan drugs constitute 40 percent of all new drugs and um, uh, so, uh, and, and so, so that's about the, uh, uh, the, uh, the rate or percentage that's affected by this, this act. And um, so if you look more closely, the 15 to 2017, you see a 34, 44%. So it's rather growing. And even for the biological, this is an important trend. So, um, G protein coupled receptors are, are a major drug target and always been uh, uh, quite uh, close to our heart. And I worked with uh, uh, David Gloriam, who's my former PhD student, who worked with uh, GPCRs in my, my group previously, as a group in Denmark now. And we looked at, uh, I mean, what is going on? What are the new agents, targets, and indications? And um, this is uh, using a large set of, uh, uh, of different databases. This is a phylogenetic tree, it doesn't maybe come very clear out, where we mark out the, the, the classical drugs and the innovative uh, drugs uh, onto the phylogenetic clusters of the uh, receptors. And uh, what we see now that we have uh, almost like 500 approved drugs for the GPCRs and they are mediated for more than 100 different GPCR targets. So, uh, and that means that 34% of all FDA approved drugs target GPCRs. Uh, we also want to, like, I mean, if you read papers in the GPCR field, often people tell about the percent of our half of the drugs. And people use a number of different, uh, um, like a set of describing the reality. But this, this is the, the closest you come with, uh, with every single target curated. And we see there's a 69 uh, GPCI established during the last five years. So there's a huge amount of activity. Uh, and uh, we also can uh, divide this into the different types of ligands uh, and where the activity is most. Obviously, traditionally, it has been in the monoamine binding with uh, receptor GPCRs, which is about 40 of them in, in the human genome. But we see that the peptide binding uh, receptors are coming very, very strong. And here, just an illustration of your list, uh, I mean, points out some of the peptide and protein binding receptors have actually been approved and are very successful. Then uh, we've also been looking at, uh, I mean, what happens in the different stage of the clinical trials. Um, and, um, and then we see that uh, uh, there, <coughs> there are, what is happening is that 
Here we see that there are more biologicals, we have more allosteric modulators, we have more biased agonists, so that there are clear trends in that. Maybe there's a higher on-target selectivity, less pharmacology for the GPCR. This is actually a contrary to what is happening in kinases. Kinases are more going towards a, a, a direction of a polypharmacology. And we see uh, uh, diseases, uh, there's a shift towards um, uh, diabetes, obesity, and Alzheimer's is a, gr is a growing field, and CNS disorder remain uh, highly uh, represented, but we feel that there's a lo large uh, um, opportunity there. So, um, reproposing the, the uh, uh, using the DPCRs again for new indications, so we have a level of 33% of the approved uh, DPCR agents, uh, have uh, more of the targets uh, have, have more than one indication. And uh, we we'll, we'll look at the different phases here and see how this uh, is affected. Uh, we can see that from the, all this data that efficacy seems to be rather the limiting factor than the safety, at least for the GPCRs. We haven't done this for all other families. What we see also is that uh, the information, and I think for everybody who is using uh, uh, drug uh, databases and other databases, that information is very, very biased. So you have to be careful when you're, when you're looking at things. And this, this uh, illustrates uh, the different biases from um, uh, just citations on the first bar about it from PubMed. We have the uh, number of crystal structures we have the number of uh, the chemical compounds, we have the um, um, number of patents, and, uh, and, uh, and uh, number of agents in clinical trials. And you see that this is like a portion of the different data set, and it's very disproportionate uh, throughout. What is happening on GPCR is a lot of uh, crystallization going on, and we see that many of the protein and peptide receptors have been crystallized, promoting the drug development in this categories. So I just want to say a few things about uh, GPCR sleep. I probably will not manage to go through the number five. I'm trying to keep the track of the time. So this picture, which we published many years ago, is a phylogenetic tree of the GPCRs, the main families of the GPCRs. And the way we see the blue arrow is the big rhodesian family that's come on the next slide. So this was the first time people could actually delineate and define the main families of GPCRs. And we coined the term adhesion family of GPCRs, which was a uh, relatively new family uh, that was growing. And we were fortunate to identify about half of these members and first to describe them and give them names in, in correspondence with the uh, Hugo Nomenclature Committee. And this is a phylogenetic tree of the, of the rhodosin family, and this is what can be used to illustrate that the ability, for example, to bind to uh, lipid compounds or the ability to bind to peptides or, or, or proteins have occurred several times during the evolution. Because people, when they group, sometimes they group all peptide uh, receptors in one box and, and, and other receptors in, uh, yeah, in different times. And that is not necessarily based on a structural or homologous uh, uh, information uh, and, and phylogenetic to probably provide. Orphan receptors is also very interesting to, def and orphan receptors here are related to those DPCR do not have a ligand. And actually in, in clinical trials, there are several orphan receptors that are being tar uh, targeted by drugs, even though we don't actually know what or if they have an endogenous ligand. So there's, there's a number of things going on that was is, is surprising the common knowledge of the field. So this is this illustration of the adhesion GPCRs, uh, which are particularly uh, different from the others because they have very long end termini. They have multiple domains. They have more similarities, for example, with many kinases of multiple domains. They are important for cell-to-cell -cell interactions. And, uh, and people are getting more and more interested in them as drug targets. This is just to show the illustrated different uh, characteristics of the different families because they obviously are related to those that they are evolutionarily related to. And uh, so we took these group and, groups and uh, we sorted out the evolutionary origin of them. Uh, and we can see that most of the main families 
uh, that uh, are found in uh, uh, bilateral species, while the subfamilies of uh, the rhodocene family are more uh, uh, differentially uh, uh, mm, represented. We have even looked at the early vertebrate evolution, and we see that GPCRs are found in the early vertebrate uh, evolution, and we see that the adhesion family has expanded the multiple uh, members. And this uh, is a phylogenetic tree and shows the different domains of all the genes that we identified in different uh, species, or some of the different species, in this case, the branchiostoma or the amphioxus, the early vertebrate, uh, compared to the human genome. And using this, we published some papers in, uh, in uh, molecular biology evolution, which is uh, very highly rated, and told the evolutionary history here of the adhesion family, and, but also of the whole set of uh, GPCRs. Uh, where we also define a set of uh, receptors that we do not think are GPCRs, even though people have called them GPCRs. And uh, we see that uh, some of the, uh, uh, the rhodopsin family is a rather young family, but actually the adhesion family, which was really rather new because people didn't know about it, actually one of the most ancient branches. And then we relate that to back, back in the evolutionary history. And this uh, alignment was particularly important for us to argue that actually the GPCRs have a common origin. So people many times said, GP the different GPCR family, they don't have any sequence homology. They cannot be homologous. This is a convergent evolution. No, we have said, when we do consensus uh, sequences and line them, we actually, we don't find any common motive from all of them, but we can walk from one to two or three different families in different regions of the, uh, of the alignments and actually link all of them together. And I think we managed to convince people about that. So we made a clear tree, we make a statistical analysis with a different algorithms to, to verify the different nodes with the convincing results. So um, I think my, all time for you because it has been a very intensive section. So I think I will just uh, skip uh, the membrane-bound receptors and uh, the clustering we, which we, we've done on that and go to the last slide here where I thank my, uh, many of my people and a lot of other people in my group who especially contributed to these slides. Thank you very much for listening. So thank you very much, and uh, this uh, presentation concludes us uh, our plenary session. I think uh, now we have enough time to meet in the hallways and discuss. Thank you for this uh, remarkably interesting talk.